Hi, everybody. So we will get started. I'm sorry the presentation on the screen isn't quite as clear as we'd normally hope it to be um, a slight technical issue here. Um, so anyway, welcome to this session introducing the Internet and how it works, but not how presenting in Zoom works at the moment. I'm very sorry for that. Um, so thank you for joining from wherever you are calling in from today, whatever your time zone. Uh, this session, the uh, IGF session 33 about Internet 101, the intention is to give a brief introduction to the Internet and how it works. Uh, it's co-hosted session with ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, an organization that I work for, and we coordinate the global allocation of unique identifiers for the Internet uh, names and numbers. And, and two of our partners in this, because we don't do it alone. We have RIPE NCC, who are the regional internet registry for Europe and the um, uh, Eastern and Central, uh, Eastern Europe and Central Asian, Asian regions and Center, which is an association of country code top level domain names. So there are, I believe, 54 members um, and they uh, um, work with the country code top level domain name managers to promote the development of uh, high standards and best practices for country code registries. Um, we are um, uh, well, of course, there's myself, Adam Peak, and as I said, I work for uh, for ICANN, Marco uh, Hovening, who works for RIPE NCC, and Peter Van Rost, who's the general manager of Center. Uh, the intention is to make a brief introduction to the internet, how it works, and a little history, and I will run through that quickly. Uh, Marco will then talk about internet protocol addresses, IP addresses, and how traffic and routing works across the internet, and then Peter will pick up on the domain name system and how it works. Um, and then we will hopefully have 10 or so minutes for your questions. But one hour is a very tight session. So thank you. And um, if I could have the next slide, please. Um, next one, we'll move on from that one, I think. So what is the internet? This is um, a definition you can see at the bottom. It's from 1992 and it's from um, RFC 1310. An RFC is a request for comments. And these are requests for comment documents. There are now over 10,000 of them are where internet standards are defined. Um, and this is taken from the uh, introduction of, the, of this particular RFC. Uh, the numbers I should say are my edits just to try and be clear about what we're talking about. Uh, they're not in the original document. So what is the internet? The definition here is a loosely organized international collaboration of autonomous interconnected networks. They support host-to-host -host communications um, through the voluntary adherence to open protocols and standards um, defined by internet standards, i.e. defined by the RFCs, the collection of RFCs. Um, so what do we mean by this? It's, it's really what um, loosely organized essentially means there's no, no there is structure but it's not rigid, it's, it's not concrete. Um, it's an international collaboration and the internet has been an international collaboration since its earliest days uh, in some of, some of the earliest concept about, internet, about the internet, what became the internet, such as packet switching, um, were a collaboration as early as 1962. Um, autonomous networks, uh, and this is one of the key points about the internet, is that the internet is not a single network. It's made up of probably over 100,000 thousand independent networks. They all um, manage their own, own policies and that can be important when we think about uh, governance and so on. Um, and um, they, they form together as interconnected networks by uh, adopting these internet protocols. Um, so they become an interconnected network, a network of networks that these autonomous networks form as the internet. And they support host-to-host -host communication. This is a slightly historic term, hosts, but they are basically uh, computers or devices uh, connected to a computer network that um, provide resources, materials, applications, and services to other devices and people that are connected to that network. Um, and one of the 
interesting and important points about this is that all of us can become the providers of information or the receivers of information across the internet. And that allows us not only its, um, its richness in terms of the applications, but also the innovation that we see across the net network. And it also, these, these factors also come together to provide robustness, um, which is one reason why I think we've seen the internet perform so um, amazingly well over the past six to seven month period. Um, it's, it's stood up well to uh, the global demands that, uh, that we put upon it. I mentioned that there's a voluntary adherence to open protocols and procedures that are, are defined by internet standards. And that is important. It goes to the idea of a loosely organized network. There's no top-down authority that tells you through a regulation or a law that you must, must, you must follow these standards. If you want to connect to the internet, if you want your autonomous network to become part of this network, then um, you will adopt the internet standards. And in this way, the internet works because it's based on um, universal, a universal techno, technology, uh, technical language. Um, and, and, and that's extremely important uh, to, to remember. Um, there are, and there are also isolated networks that, that don't interconnect, but they will use internet standards. So they're not part of the global internet, but they're using the same standards. And these will often, you can think of these as being corporate intranets, for example, where the corporation is using the standards, but it's not connecting and all the network traffic is is essentially internal so that's the thought of what the internet is and of course if you have any questions we can please use the uh, Q&A pod and we'll come to those questions either answering them during the presentations or um, or at the end so thank you and could I have the next slide please this is even going further back in time, the 1962 reference I made earlier. And what you can see here are four net diagrams of different networks. Um, the idea was that in 1962, a gentleman called Paul Barron was working for the Rand Corporation. And his task or his, his research work was looking at different types of command and control network. What would be robust? What could survive um, an outage in one of those network nodes? the little black block dots that you see there. Um, so in, and this is where the internet is associated with the survival of nuclear, nuclear war. And that was certainly one of Barron's intentions, but he was also looking at robust, robust networks for the space program and other major public uh, activities at the time. And you can see that should there be an outage the decentral, sorry, the uh, the the centralized uh, network is is not going to survive particularly well if one node node is removed. Um, what we're looking at really is this decentralized network in the middle of the middle of your screen, um, where traffic will flow across the network, taking any of the routes that are, are there. And I think Marco will explain how that happens in a moment. Um, and if one of the nodes is removed uh, for whatever reason, then traffic will be able to find another path to make its way across the network. So that is really the very basics of the internet. And the diagram you see on the right-hand side is a scan of a sketch of the original ARPA network, um, December, 1969. And this is a copy of a scribble, well, a little bit more than the scribble, a diagram that was drawn to explain how four different uh, research uh, labs would connect uh, across what would become the ARPANET. And they would, over time, and not too many years, by the early 1970s, begin to adopt uh, the decentralized network model and packet switching uh, technologies so that uh, they would be able to uh, share computing resources, uh, share research, and of course, communicate with the earliest of the email protocols that were developed around that time. Um, and if I could have the next slide, please. And that is me done. Uh, so thank you very much. That's my email address, adam.peak at ican.org. You can see three URLs there, our main website, 
ICANN.org. Um, the second one, Get Started, is um, a page that has some information about uh, fellowship programs and other activities that we use to get involved, how you could get involved with ICANN. And then learn.ican.org is a set of resources that we have for courses and online learning um, about what ICANN does, but also some broader issues such as cybersecurity um, and other technologies, internet technologies. So these slides will be made available, all the slides, so um, you don't have to scribble that down at the moment. They will be available for you. Thank you very much, and uh, over to you, Marco. Yes, so if I can share my screen, there we go. Share. This is a bit of a challenge, how to explain the internet uh, in, in less than 15 minutes. So uh, please bear with me. If you already seen some of the technical presentations, you'll notice I'll skip on a lot of details. But what are IP addresses and how does routing work on the internet? The two go hand in hand. How does your packet get to its destination? And when I talk about packets, if my slides would advance, yes. Uh, if I talk about packets, then uh, yes, I really talk about packets, cardboard boxes. That's, it's essentially the internet, a data packet is nothing more than a cardboard box. And you know, anything can fit in that cardboard box and that's fine. And I type it shut and nobody really cares what's in it. And then I can use any variety of mechanisms to get it to its destination, trucks, planes, ships, I can carry it myself. I can hire somebody to do that. It's really not 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 all that strange, right? If you think about it. So, uh, and and yeah, sticking a bit to this cardboard box and then post analogies to 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 try to sort of cross what what makes the internet the internet. And uh, yeah, uh, you may have already seen there's a familiar shape here. And and if we depict the internet we usually pick then this the hourglass model which which is narrow middle this is the internet protocol and and essentially that that is indeed nothing much more than cardboard boxes and most importantly if you start sending cardboard boxes around you need a shipping label now we've all seen this one i guess it it's shouldn't take a lot of time to explain of course most importantly it tells you where it goes it tells you the destination it usually also tells you a a sender address that that's useful because if something happens to the package they can notify you and of course the receiver can send you a thank you note or even send you a more meaningful reply so it's all there and usually it has something like the size on it and as this one says yeah priority well we all know what that means right it, it makes you pay a bit more and makes you feel good but whether it really makes it go faster well nobody really knows uh, looking at an internet packet header and i took this straight from one of those rfc's one of those standards that describe the internet protocol you look at it and what you see here is is virtually the same it has a destination address it tells you where it's going has a source address, also useful, tells you where it's coming from. You can send replies to it. You can tell if something happens to the packet. It has a size, total length. You see type of service. You see several options. So yes, I can theoretically tag this as priority. Yes, I can put a sticker on saying, sorry, this is fragile. Don't drop this packet. All that kind of stuff is all there. So it's not that much different from a cardboard box. And if you think about it then, what makes the internet the internet very much means that that address needs to be unique. Because if I just take a box and I write Paris on the box, it could end up in Texas or it ends up in France. Nobody knows. And there are many places called London and God knows how many noise stops Germany has. So the purpose of all this is that my address stays unique. That's very much the most important bit on the internet, that we all agree that if it says address, that that address only exists in a single place on the internet, which is where we come in, the regional internet registries, because that's essentially what we do. We make sure that IP addresses remain unique and we found a relatively easy and, and, and uh, low key way to do that because we publish a list of all the addresses in use and, and put a pointer there, who is using them. And, and that's basically it. So whenever somebody says and, and rolls up to my door and says like, hey, I need a bunch of internet addresses. 
sure. I, I grab a block of addresses and say like, there you go. You're, you're my member. Here's, here's a block of addresses. This now becomes your responsibility. And there are five of us doing that across the world. It's a tiny little map here. We won't spend a lot of time. But essentially, the idea is that you go and pick the RER of where you are located. So if your network is in Europe, you'll end up at my place. If your network is in Africa, you talk to my colleagues in, in Afrinic and, and they will hand you a bunch of addresses. Of course, globally still needs to be unique. So we work, the five of us, we also work with, with ICANN and, and the IANA to make sure that yes, there is also a global list that says like, okay, these blocks are the responsibility for I and these blocks are the responsibility for a PNIC. But that's essentially it. So an address is assigned to a network. And, and that's an important bit. And I wanna spend a bit of time here because often people think that an IP address is an identity and it actually isn't. If you move house, your address will change. Like so, if you move from one, one network to the next, your IP address will change. And Peter later on will talk a bit about how we managed to prevent you having to remember all those addresses. But it is essentially, the IP address is a location in the network. Now, of course, there is often some implications because if your IP address, if your network is only in Germany, then people will simply say like, oh yeah, that's a German IP address. But really it isn't because if you expand your network into France, then for sure some of these addresses will be used in France. It, it is really just sort of, it follows the infrastructure. So it, it, it makes it possible to get the package to the front door. Uh, and that's exactly what your ISP does. If a packet has your IP address on it, your ISP will carry it via your DSL or via your cable, will drop it off your door. And your little Wi-Fi box, is actually a tiny bit smarter than it sometimes seems, knows whether it is your phone who asked for something on Facebook or whether it is your Apple TV streaming something from Netflix. And it's usually like, hey, this is a reply from Netflix and hands it off to your Apple TV or, hey, this is a Facebook reply. It goes to your phone. And that happens in your house, but at the macro scale, this also happens a lot in networks, which brings me to the next part. How does the internet knows where an address is? So finding your way. Well, as I said, each network has its own range of IP addresses, either delegated by me to that network operator or What's also often C is delegated by another, usually what we then say parent network. So like your house, you get an IP address from your ISP who probably got it from me. So there are multiple layers of delegation there. The smaller you get, the more parties there probably are in between. And as I said, each system or node has its own address coming from a range assigned to that network. Now, of course, network size is very considerably. Your little network at, the, at your house is nowhere comparable to, for instance, a Google data center. And it isn't as the global span of, for instance, a Netflix or an Amazon network. But the grouping, as I said, what you usually see is really following the infrastructure layout. So if you take a bunch of IP addresses, and, and this is how your network or how your computer will see an IP address, it's just a string of 32 bits, you will notice that they're almost the same, only at the tiny little very end, there are small differences. Now, if I switch that to sort of the more common use description of an IP address, you know, those, those four decimals with, with dots in between, zero to 255, what you get here is that you see that all these addresses start with 193.0.6 and, and they all sort of sit in that same network. And if you look up the registry, you will find that I'm responsible for those addresses. And indeed, I as the right NCC because this is actually our network. Now inside that network are a bunch of computers, but frankly, you shouldn't care about it. You don't care. As long as that packet gets to the right NCC, we'll, we'll figure out which computer it is. We'll figure out whether it's our Whoa server or whether it's an office machine or whether it's our web server. So looking at it back from the macro scale, 
let's say I have two networks and these networks interconnect. So they build a physical connection between the two or more fancy, they go via an internet exchange point. As long as they agree that like, okay, if a packet starts with 193, I give it to network A and network A on their turn get told by network B, anything that starts with 194, for instance, I know where that is. And that's essentially how internet routing works. So think about it again from a postman's perspective. You know, if I just if if I send the packet to Brazil, if I drop it off at the post, post station here in the Netherlands, they don't need to know a lot. All they need to know is get it to the airport, get it on, you know, the next plane to Brazil and be done. They'll sort it out on the other side. And that's essentially also how the internet works. All I have to do is look at the very first beginning of that internet address and I figure out where that packet needs to go. And of course, there are many more networks and I might have customers that have their own ranges of IP addresses. But all I basically do is tell everybody around me, these are my addresses or here is a bunch of addresses that I know how to get to. And if everybody does that, then basically every router on the internet in its own memory builds a picture of where everything else is and how to get to that destination. And like I said, all it really has to do is a quick glimpse on that address label, a quick glimpse saying like, okay, I know where that address is and end it off to the next hop. And that's what makes the internet so blindingly fast, but it also makes the internet so, yeah, cheap, so affordable, because really there isn't a lot to it. As long as you can read that packet header, you're fine and you don't care what's in it. And in fact, that's the other big part of the internet. The postman shouldn't care what's in it. And in fact, I don't want the postman to care what's in it. In fact, I don't want him to look in my packets. Now, of course, there's a bit of trust there, but encryption also comes a long way. But yeah, just read the label, get it to his destination, have them sort it out. And that's sort of the fundamental part of internet routing. Do as little as possible. Just get it to the destination as quickly as you can. No guarantees, best effort. We'll do our best to get it there as soon as possible. That is the internet in, well, pretty much 10 minutes. There's a lot more to say. Have a look at our website, pop me an email. I'll leave some time for Q and I, but with that, I'm gonna give it to Peter to show the more human side of the internet. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Hello, everyone. My name is Peter van Rosten. Um, I'm going to talk you through uh, the DNS, the domain name system. Um, if we summarize what we heard before, uh, Adam gave the briefest ever overview of what the internet is. Um, he basically talked about the infrastructure, the, the network, the cables that connect different servers at universities in 1969. Uh, hundreds of thousands of devices uh, 10 years ago, billions of devices now, smartphones, um, PCs, servers, uh, Google infrastructure with all the YouTube movies, Facebook with all the Facebook messages and posts. Um, Marco then picked up and Marco explained how traffic moves from one network to the other. Um, in boxes. It's packets, small packets that are being shared all over the world, sent from A to B. And A to B is what computers understand. Uh, these are IP addresses. Um, every device connected needs to have a unique IP address, whether it's your mobile or your PC. Um, I'm going to talk you through the, um, the interface with the internet that we're more familiar with, uh, the domain name system. So, why do we need the DNS? Um, what is it? Um, who controls it and, and who sets the policies? And, and then finally, last minute or so, I'm going to spend on some dark clouds that are forming on the horizon. So um, this is what Marco talked about. IP addresses, you'll see IPv4 addresses, which are the, the simple standard ones, 193, et cetera. 
um, and the IPv6 addresses, which is the, the new generation of addresses uh, um, enlarging the, uh, the available uh, number of the domain of uh, IP addresses um, to uh, uh, hundreds of billions um, and uh, getting uh, helping us out through the restrictions that the IPv4 addresses present. Um, but these are unrecognizable to, to human beings. Um, most of these represent sites that are um, highly popular uh, in a couple of European countries. And you'll see them here. Um, European Union's websites. Um, also email addresses. Uh, we typically think of this as uh, destinations of websites and things where we gather, we, where we, we, we grab content from. Um, but they can also be used for, for infrastructure that serves to send emails back and forth. As Marco says, nobody cares about what's in the packet. Um, and finally, worth pointing out here is that um, from um, for, for decades, we've been very used to a, a Latin script based internet. Uh, thanks to the efforts of the ICANN community, um, we now have a, um, a much broader range of, uh, of characters that we can use, in, including, for instance, Cyrillic, uh, the example that I've used here. So why do we need the DNS? It's obvious, right? Remembering addresses, nobody would remember, especially an IPv6 address. Um, the hexadecimal um, numbering uh, that I showed earlier, um, but it's much easier uh, and much more commercially interesting to have something that's recognizable as a brand. Just think of, uh, of all the, the, the big tech names that you can come up with. Secondly, there's also an advantage uh, in flexibility. Um, if a part of the infrastructure burns down, which happens more often than, than, than you would probably uh, think, um, it is quite easy in the DNS to um, link a domain name to a different IP address. Uh, and it is something that the end user does not see. He still goes to his favorite uh, newspaper's website and he doesn't care where the content is coming from. So flexibility is another important reason why we have the DNS. So what is the domain name system? It's a hierarchical and decentralized naming system that connects devices, all sorts of devices. Hierarchical and decentralized are key here because they are the, fundam the, they are the fundamental values that underline uh, key properties of the DNS. Hierarchical uh, means that it's, um, it's structured along a, a, a tree shape, but it allows for decisions to be made at every uh, branch of the tree. Um, practically speaking, that means that uh, if you have a, a country code top level domain, and we'll get to that in a minute, um, for instance, .pl, where we are, are virtually meeting, it's the uh, registry for the .pl uh, domain that sets the policies for that zone. That's very important. That means that one country, for instance, in a country code top level domain, uh, environment cannot decide on the policies for the other country. And sim similarly, uh, .com cannot decide on the policies for .org or the other way around. So that's really important. It, it provides us, the operators of the domains with autonomy and the, it allows them to respect the interests of their local internet community, users, uh, or local laws. And then also it's decentralized. There is no single point of failure. Um, and that led us to a DNS, which has proven to be very secure and reliable uh, over the, the, the last couple of decades. The DNS exists since uh, 1985, by the way. So let's take a closer look, right? Uh, everybody has, uh, has typed in this address a couple of times the last couple of days. Um, if we zoom into it, um, we see a couple of interesting things. So first of all, um, this is the protocol. It has nothing to do with the domain name. Uh, it tells your, your it tells your browser uh, in in what way and what type of content it will be fetching from this address, this domain name. Secondly, and this was not a mistake, there is a hidden dot at the end. Um, our browser uh, knows that we're lazy, so it just adds it. Uh, we never do. We never spell it out uh, either. If we we when we we uh, spell out the domain name, but uh, basically, at the end of every domain name, there is a final dot. And that final dot tells your browser or your machine to fetch um, information from what we call the root. Secondly, we uh, see, starting from the right, the top level domain. Uh, for the uh, IGF domain, it's a .org. 
Uh, further down the line, we have the second level domain. And then we have, well, the third level domain and so on. But in this case, it's the uh, naming of the web server that the internet governance form is using to service all the content. If you look at the same thing, um, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to click. Um, if we look at the same thing from a different uh, angle, this is what we see. It's a hierarchical structure. So on top, there's the root, that hidden dot. Then there's a top level domains, uh, about 1,500 of them, .org being one, .pl, .eu, but also the new kits on the block like uh, .brussels and uh, .website, I believe. Um, then you have the second level domain where uh, under the .eu domain, you, you start zooming in and you have Europa.eu, Google.eu, Europe.eu, et cetera. And then each of those can um, manage their own third level domain or um, domain server. Um, Europe is a really good example because they use their third level domains to assign to a European Court of Justice, which is Curia, uh, to the European Commission, which is EC, um, or to their email server, which is uh, SMTP. Um, SMTP is a, an abbreviation of the mailing protocol. Importantly, who decides which top level domains exist? Just imagine that somebody would be able to pull a switch and say, we don't like .be, Belgium. I'm a Belgian, so I can use that example safely. Uh, we, we're going to just uh, erase it from the zone. So who decides on that? Uh, who decides on which new uh, top level domains are added? And who decides on who can register second level domain? Answering those questions first takes us to the root. Um, this is what it looks like. It's, uh, quite unimpressive, but it's basically it. It's a simple server sitting somewhere in a rack. This is in uh, Stockholm. Um, the, uh, the root uh, consists of a single text file. And I, I know some of the techies will crunch now. I cringe now, but imagine as a simple text file um, that just lists uh, all the uh, domains that it holds. So for the root, it's all the top level domains plus some additional information. Um, and there's a copy on the server. Um, there are 13 copies of the root, uh, identical copies, managed by different organizations. That's uh, in order to assure uh, redundancy of the system. If one fails, the 12 others will operate as usual and the user end user will not see anything happening. Uh, additionally, each of these 13 copies has thousands of additional copies uh, held by ISPs, for instance. Uh, they're they're a typical uh, user of, uh, of of those uh, those copies to serve their customers even quicker. The responses that customers are looking for. Uh, importantly, who's managing uh, the route? Um, it's an organization called PTI, the Public Technical Identifiers Organization. They are um, uh, an organization managed by uh, ICANN. Uh, they used to be called IANA. But in uh, 2016, something really important happened. Remember that I told you that nobody can pull the switch? Well, theoretically, until 2016, somebody could. And that was the United States government. Um, at that moment in time, they handed over the, uh, the management of uh, the PTI function to the ICANN community. And the beautiful thing there is that in that ICANN community, it's not ICANN org, um, nor its CEO, um, nor any individual or individual group that can make the decisions. The, the ICANN community is a beautiful example of multi-stakeholderism in action. So the policies for the route, which domain gets added, which gets deleted, how do they get deleted? How do we transition out domains that are no longer relevant, like .yu, which uh, was uh, the domain that was uh, was used by, um, by Yugoslavia. Um, how, how do we make those changes? These decisions are made by the ICON community. And uh, I really suggest you take up uh, Alec, uh, Adam on his, uh, his call to, uh, to look at uh, newcomers information, how to, to participate and join ICON. Um, it's, uh, it's well worth. I told you about that flat text file. This is what it looks like. Um, it's just a, uh, might be a bit small to see, I don't know for you, but it's a, it's a, a list of all the domains um, ranked in a text file, not even some fancy database or Excel sheet. Um, here I took the example of what the in entry into the root for the .eu domain uh, looks like. 
And here you see that it shows a couple of instances where you can find information about the .eu zone file. I, I really liked um, Marco's reference to your postman doesn't care about uh, where in Brazil he needs to deliver the package. He just ships it to Brazil. The same thing basically works for the for the domain name system. The first time you ask the root the information about the domain name, it doesn't really care about the second level domain and the third level domain. The answer that it provides you will tell you where to fetch information for the top level domain. So the equivalent of Brazil in Marco's example. So further down, top level domains, what's important here? Um, you might have seen that they look quite different. You have country codes, top level domains like uh, .pl um, and GTLDs where .com is obviously the, the giant uh, and most of the others are dwarfs. And think of uh, ratios of 160 million .com names and a few thousand for some of the new GTLDs that, uh, that have been around for, for a couple of years now. Um, what is the difference between the two, um, aside for, um, for the simple fact that uh, CCTLDs have two characters and GTLDs have three or more? Um, things got a bit more complicated now that we introduced uh, uh, non-ASCII characters, so Chinese characters and kanji and um, hangul and, 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 and um, other uh, different scripts. Um, but in essence, CCTLD is two characters, GTLD is three or more. Why should you care? Because the policies that manage that rule these domains are quite different. Um, CCTLDs are managed locally. So they're serving a local internet community. They, they abide by local laws um, and their policies are set locally by that internet community. Sometimes that community is not, uh, I would say uh, discussing things on equal footing. Uh, in some cases, CCTLD is managed by the government. Obviously, the government departments are going to have a much stronger voice in those discussions on what these policies look like than, say, commercial industry or, or the banking association. In other CCTLDs, is truly a multi-stakeholder approach to setting these policies. And um, you, you see that reflected in the fact that you will not find two CCTLDs across the globe that have similar policies. GTLDs, they are managed by an independent operator. Uh, you bid for a uh, contract with, uh, with ICON to win the GTLD and you pay handsomely for it. And then you, uh, you're all set. Uh, you can set your own policies, but within very strict limits of the framework that is set again by the ICON community. And those can include things like, how do you deal with your channels? Um, how do you announce pricing increases? Uh, how do you deal with your uh, personal information of the people that are holding a, a, a domain within your zone. Um, we have, I will not play it here because I think it's a bit dumb to have uh, 41 people uh, watching a movie uh, during a presentation, but I really recommend you to, to have a, a look at our video on how the DNS works on YouTube. It's two minutes. Um, but what it will basically tell you is that is what happens when you're at your desk and you send an email or you type in an address in, in your browser. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll spoil the surprise, but what happens is there are three questions that are being asked in very quick succession. Think everything happening without, within a couple of milliseconds. The first question is that hidden dot, remember? So the first question is to the root, and it will ask the root, where do I find, and I'll stick to the internet governance example, uh, IGF example, where do I find .org? The root will send you back an answer and say, all the information that is held in, in the .org domain, you'll find at this IP address. The second question goes to that specific IP address that you've been just told by the root, and you ask to the .org, where do I find the information about int.gov forum? .org. And .org holds all that information in the database, the flat file that I showed you earlier. Um, and so it goes on. And so the next thing, the next question, the third question is, where do I find www.indgovforum.org? Uh, and you will again receive an IP address in response to that query. So it's three questions that are being asked. And why is it three, not just one, which would be quicker and simpler? That 
that takes you back to the to the um, hierarchical uh, structure of the DNS um, and to its distributed nature. So hence three questions. It makes it more stable. Um, it allows you also to duplicate the instances uh, of the, uh, the zone files uh, on each level. So it makes it more robust in case uh, there is an attack or, a, or, or, or just a, a simple technical failure. So watch the video, but I'll basically summarize for you. It's three questions and it goes very quick and it's very re reliable. Um, amazingly, already time to wrap up. So the DNS is a distributed hierarchical system and that allows for setting separate policies for each of the top level domains. Um, these policies are set by the local internet community. Remember about the multi-stakeholder approach that I told you for CCTLDs uh, and the multi-stakeholder -stakeholder approach that is uh, taken by the ICANN community. The DNS is redundant. So many instances of the same type of information available. It's, uh, it's highly resilient and it's flexible. Um, and I just realizing that obviously I didn't tell you uh, yet about the dark clouds uh, forming uh, on the horizon. Um, so what are these? Um, when, when listening to this presentation, I hope that one of the things you realized is this DNS thing is pretty important in, in getting people to access content. Well, obviously it is, um, but the DNS is not strictly necessary to access content. However, that part of the story is typically lost uh, on, on what I'm sure are well-intended people, um, um, governments in particular, but not only governments, that listen to the first part of the story. And they think that the DNS could actually be a really good way to get back control over content. Um, we've all seen the debates about fake news. There, we've heard hundreds of stories with which we obviously can relate and think that this is probably not the, um, the nicest uh, aspect of, of this wonderful invention called the internet. Um, somebody would need to do something about it. And some people think that it's the DNS that should be used as a control mechanism to regulate access to content or not. You could block queries, right? So I told you about the three questions. You could tell ISPs whenever they see passing one of these questions to pick it up and to tell a lie uh, and to divert you to a server from local law enforcement rather than say the server of uh, the Pirate Bay that you're looking for. In some countries there is legislation in place that does exactly that. So it tells the DNS to lie. But the DNS was never built to act as a control mechanism. So it will always be highly inefficient to do so. Um, the DNS was built to uh, allow people to, uh, uh, re to, to to allow people to rely on the information that they receive from the system, to trust the answers that they're getting from the system, because in the end, um, how how um, well would we be doing if we couldn't trust anymore that when we're going to our bank by typing in the address in a browser bar, you actually end up there. So. Um, the good thing is we also have a video on that. I'm not going to show that one either, uh, but my colleague Polina might be uh, dropping, I, I don't keep an eye on the chat, but my, my colleague Polina might be dropping uh, the, um, the links to uh, both videos in, uh, in the chat. Um, this video explains uh, this quite complex story about the DNS and content control, what can and what cannot be done. Um, and I believe that it will be an essential part of the, many uh, upcoming uh, regulatory and policy discussions in the coming months. So, okay, the, um, the dark cloud reference was, uh, was probably more to get your attention. Um, I, it is not that, the future is not that dark, but it's really an important aspect of this debate and people will need to be informed. So hopefully we can contribute to that. So with that, slightly changing my conclusion um, by just adding one more point. The DNS is not designed to be a control point for content regulation. And that's it. Further info on central.org, or um, you can email me directly if you have any questions uh, at peter at central.org. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Peter. Thank you very much, Marco.
Um, it, now we're available for questions, answers. Hopefully we'll be able to answer. So if you have any questions, please uh, use the Q&A pod. And I think we will probably be able to answer anything that's mentioned in the chat as well. Um, I do see that um, there is a question that's uh, waiting to be answered. So I think it's for you, Marco. Anything that mentions IPv6, is, uh, which I think you'll explain, is certainly for you. So uh, thank you. Got caught out red-handed there for not doing what I tell everybody else to do, and that is to use the wrong example. No, yeah, uh, of course, uh, IPv6, IPv4, uh, the mechanism stays the same, and, and, and part of the reason why I used IPv4 in this deck is, uh, as you saw, IPv4 addresses are relatively short, and that means they easily fit on a slide. Now, of course, on the internet, that's a different story because there are only 4 billion addresses and we've got many more people and many more devices using the internet. So that's a problem. But if I try to explain it, I usually use IPv4 because people recognize it, but also simply if I would have used an IPv6 address, it would have not fit on the slide. I would have had two monitors next to each other to show you an IPv6 address. So that's it. But the principle of that cardboard box stays the same. What I usually sort of in, in the way to describe it, it, it's the same cardboard box. We use a slightly different and a slightly bigger address label that fits a lot more of the address space on it. But the principles, routing, the principles of an address being a location in the network, that's all still the same. Thank you for your question, Sabine. And with that, I hope there are others. There's two open questions now. Huh. VPN geo blocking. Uh, yeah, I can. I can probably. Yeah, ver that that. It's a bit tricky, but yeah, essentially what you do with a VPN is that you basically use sort of a remailer function. You put a cardboard box in another cardboard box. So from an IP address perspective, is it, it first gets routed to your VPN provider, who then takes off the outer box and then sends the packet on its way to its real destination. And then when the packet and answer returns, they kind of do the same. They put a box around it and then ship it back to you. So that's kind of a bit of an extra security. In terms of geo-blocking, as I said, it, it's, it's, it's hit or miss. You have a reasonable sense if you understand the infrastructure that an certain range of IP addresses is in a certain country or is in a certain city. And then people sort of collect that information and turn that into commercial services that allow you to, for instance, say like, okay, I'm gonna show you my website in French because I think you're in France or no, you can't watch this game because you're actually in the city that it's being played in. Uh, sometimes they use real-time info from ISPs. Sometimes they collect that information from, for instance, our own databases. Sometimes it's mix and match. So that, that's basically how that works. And, and I see, yeah, uh, like the browser works the same way as a VPN. I don't know. There's a lot of questions for me. Is there anybody talking, asking anything for Peter yet? <laughs> uh. Hi, hi, Marco. I, I see one for, for me here. And sorry, it's just slipped off the page. Um, Excuse me one moment. Where is that chat box? Uh, Susan Anthony, I know it was from. Hello, Susan. And uh, the, there are those... Oops, okay, I'm sorry, the screen is jumping around in front of me. Um, there are those who would say that I, if ICANN can address DNS abuse, it should also be able to address uh, intellectual property infringement. Could you explain the difference, please? Um, ICANN does certainly address uh, some aspects of DNS abuse, um, and it would be foolish of me to try and e explain exactly what we do, because that's not my role within ICANN. But we do have a session on November the 9th, um, uh, which is um, the, the workshop 317 
three, yeah, 317, DNS abuse in the age of COVID-19, some lessons learned. So that will certainly explain where ICANN gets involved in DNS abuse. And, and we get involved in um, how the domain name system itself is, is abused as opposed to the content that um, is carried across it. Um, and uh, which which is which is ICANN's role. We have an operational technical remit um, in intellectual property, as many people will know. Um, we've developed various rights protection mechanisms over the years, and rights protection mechanisms were one of the first things that ICANN developed when it was established in 1998. And those have been a continuous sort of uh, an evolutionary uh, development over the years at ICANN. Um, but I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to try and punt a bit on this question because I think I would I would uh, not be able to do it justice but there is a session as I mentioned workshop 317 which will be on November the 9th and um, I think that would probably uh, you, you'll get a, a, a better and better answer there Susan uh, so thank you very much um, I see two questions well a question from uh, Reboni um, about the uh, the costs of uh, of CCTLDs versus GTLDs, um, it's not as clear cut. Uh, the uh, end user price largely depends on um, the pricing um, methods that the um, agent uh, will use. Typically, you will not be able to buy a domain name directly from the manager of the zone file, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, for GTLDs, it always works via a um, sales agent, which we are calling a registrar uh, in the industry. For most CCTLDs, the same mechanism applies. So you would not buy it directly from the um, registry that manages the domain. Um, and then it depends enormously on what type of additional services the registrar adds to that domain. Uh, are they selling you a, a hosting package as well, or do they provide you with email addresses? Uh, et cetera. So that will define much more the pricing of the TLD than the wholesale price that the agent is paying to the um, registry. Um, and then if you allow me, I saw a uh, question from Pablo as well, Hino uh, Rosa, but I, um, oh yes, here it is. Um, the DNS and the addressing system are elements that help with a global open, interoperable, and stable internet. Is there a viable alternative to this? Say an internet where cyber sovereignty can be defended. Um, it's a an, an, an very interesting um, discussion um, for sure. What currently, what, what C, I mean, we, we had recently in, within the ICANN environment, we had a discussion within, between CCTLDs as what are, what are the CCTLDs role in this, in this uh, sovereignty discussion? More and more countries calling for more control, um, calling for a national internet, looking at national or regional initiatives, banning uh, services from other regions. We, we all know plenty of examples of that. And we believe that CCTLDs actually provide a perfect example uh, to, to counterbalance that uh, overheating discussion. CCTLDs set their local policy. So you are able to define the rules with which your um, target national community typically um, can, can, can manage and, and, and um, get its online identity, which is basically what a, what a domain name uh, often is, right? Um, at the same time, despite the fact that they are um, ruled by national rules, um, CCTLDs have cooperated now for a couple of decades on, on a global level. And uh, they, they show that collaboration is actually vital and key to, to, to um, have a global operational uh, system um, that is very secure. So, so we believe that we provide a, a, a really good example in that discussion of how things can be organized with respect to national sovereignty. Thank you, Peter. I will try and attempt to answer a question here from uh, Rabonet uh, Ferguson. I'm sorry, I do hope I got your first name somewhat close. Um, and it's Adam, who has the last say in ICANN? It seems it is touted that as a multi-stakeholder, everybody has the same vote type of structure. Uh, but when it comes to final decisions, question mark? Okay, well, the idea is 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 pretty straightforward. We, um, 
an issue will come into ICANN through a bottom-up process, which means that um, an individual, a community group, um, someone can raise an issue and this will be brought forward. Um, it will go through a policy development process, if that's the correct correct process. Um, there will be opportunities for public comment with the various community members, um, both of which Marco and Peter are um, representing their particular interests and many others, internet users, non-commercial actors, uh, private sector, etc. Um, and when the final report is delivered, that will go to the board of directors. The board has the responsibility to um, ensure that the policy processes which have been defined over ICANN's period of existence are followed. Um, the, the policy processes should be um, predictable uh, and understandable. So the board will review, have these processes been uh, correctly followed and uh, it may have some judgments on, on some of the examples and then it should pass the process. It should implement, ask the staff to then support the implementation of that particular policy, supporting the community, the staff supporting the community in doing that. So the board, of course, has an important say. It ensures that it's um, the, the proposed policy is within the bylaws, it's meeting financial and other requirements, that it's not affecting the security and stability of the internet, and that the policy development processes themselves have been accurately and correctly followed as according to the bylaws. Um, and if the board wishes to reject something, it has to do so um, with a certain majority of, of decision-making, and it will go back to the particular policy process to be reviewed. So it's not thrown out out of hand, and the board and the staff most certainly do not make policy themselves. Um, it's convoluted and, and quite difficult to explain, but I hope that was, uh, was, was helpful. Um, we seem to have run out of time to answer the questions. We will try to take these uh, and find a way to, to provide the answers, perhaps on the ICANN booth or one of our other booths that are available, um, and you'll find that in the ICANN village. Um, this session was originally proposed to be part of the youth track and um, the Internet Governance Youth, I think you, those of you who are here, um, we as three organizations would be very pleased to have further discussions with you and the IGF Secretariat have offered to try and facilitate that. So I hope you will see some message on your, your discussion lists um, about how that may happen. Um, and certainly it's been a, a good session for us. Um, any very quick closing remarks, Peter or Marco, but we are right at the top of the hour. So um, thank you. I, I did my best typing as many answers as I could in the Q&A regarding some of the more and more IP related things. So if you people might want to have a look there and found that I may have answered their question. But that's it. And yeah, of course, feel free to drop by the NRO boot that's in the village, the virtual village, or yeah, indeed mail me or have a look at our website. Well, thank you for organizing this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marco. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um, this session will be available on the YouTube channels. And of course, the Zoom recording will be available, which will also have the chat session uh, saved. And the presentation will also be made available. So you'll see the presentation files as well. So with that, thank you very much. And um, have a great rest of your day, depending on what time of that day is. And, and let's uh, enjoy what uh, this particular Tuesday has to offer. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining. Thanks, Adam, for organizing. Hey, Val. See you later, Peter.